Hello everyone, today I'm going to explain a bit more about how inertial navigation actually works. Now I've touched on this twice before, once when I was talking about uh, space navigation and once when I was talking about the recent Soyuz launch failure, where a essentially a wrong calibration of the inertial navigation system was uh, the fault for the failure of this rocket launch. But today I want to go a little bit more in detail on what it is and how it works. Inertial navigation is a rather common type of navigation. It's usually used in combination with some other navigational system or several because it has to be recalibrated sometimes, but it is very common because it pretty much always works just for a limited amount of time because it has to be recalibrated after a while. And the basic principle is that you take things that you can actually physically measure, like rotation and acceleration, and then extrapolate your entire movements based on a calibrated starting point. Now, speed is relative, so there is no physical sensor that can directly measure speed. You can measure speed relative to other objects, but Acceleration is not actually relative. You can have an accelerometer, you can measure acceleration, you can measure g-forces, and this is an absolute measurement, apart from, of course, a theory of relativity or gravity being a distortion of space-time, so a free fall not actually being an acceleration. I'll come back to that later. But as such, acceleration can be measured by a simple internal sensor. Nowadays, you can use a rather simple piezoelectronic chips. Uh, but even in older times, you would essentially use a weighted piece of mass that hangs suspended with uh, suspension and dampness so that if you accelerated the whole construction, that weight would... Uh, hang in a slightly different position, and thus you could measure the acceleration. And rotation is a little bit different from linear movement, because rotation is actually absolute. Uh, obviously, centrifugal forces uh, happen through rotation, and the faster you're rotating, the stronger the centrifugal forces become. Rotation basically has a an acceleration element. Every point that is not the center of this rotation, or the center of gravity in this case, is accelerating as it is going in a circle around that point. So rotation can actually be measured absolutely using a gyroscope, or again a piezoelectric element, rather than having to integrate angular acceleration. And from rotation and acceleration, you can now extrapolate your path if you know a starting point. You can integrate your angular velocity, and thus you can uh, extrapolate how your orientation changes over the whole flight. And if you know your orientation at the starting point, then that means you know your orientation over time over the entire flight. You can then measure your acceleration over the entire flight, and integrate that too, of course, correcting the direction based on your orientation. And you can integrate that, and thus know how your velocity changed over the entire flight. And if you know your velocity at the starting point, you can add this acceleration, this velocity change, to your starting velocity, or to the velocity right before, and thus know your now velocity, or your overall velocity throughout the flight. And then you have a uh, flight path, essentially, since you know your velocity th over time throughout the whole flight. You know what kind of path you've been moving along. If you also know where you started, you can add your flight path to that starting point, and know where you are now, and where you are during your entire flight. Now, there are a few different methods for integrating this. Of course, it's not a mathematically perfect integration, because you don't know your complete acceleration over time as a mathematical function. You have measuring points, maybe once a millisecond, or ten times per millisecond, or ten times per second, if you're less precise. 
you are measuring your acceleration and you have to integrate these points numerically by making a rough approximation of what the overall curve might look like. And of course that is one of the reasons why this might lack in precision. Now the simplest way to integrate these is to just add. You have one column, you know your current position, current velocity, current acceleration. So you add your current acceleration to your current velocity to gain the next velocity. You add your current velocity to your current position to gain your next position and you measure your next acceleration and so you get the next column. And then you repeat the whole process over and over. This is the simplest way to uh, integrate this. This is also the simplest way to run a basic, uh, a basic numeric simulation of a Newtonian physics object moving. But it's not very precise because you're assuming that your acceleration happens in short jerks, only in one point always, and that your uh, flight path is essentially edged. What's a bit more precise is to assume that your ac acceleration is constant over one time step and then use little parabola pieces essentially to piece your, together your flight path rather than little straight pieces and you still have a little imprecision because you're still assuming that your acceleration is constant within each time step and then suddenly changes between them but you're already getting a little bit closer, you're uh, reducing your error by a factor of two or three depending on circumstances and it's only taking a few percent more computing power to do uh, of course it also depends on what kind of acceleration sensors you have if these sensors actually only measure a short measuring point of acceleration or if these sensors themselves actually measure the average acceleration over an expanded time span and you can use similar tricks to make your uh, simulation more and more precise if you actually know something about the physics of this object. If, for example, you're navigating a spacecraft and you know how that spacecraft work, you know how the engines work, then you can make educated assumptions on what that means for the acceleration and what that means for a likely acceleration function and you can build in all these little details into your algorithm and make it a lot more precise but ultimately you're also limited by the precision of your sensors and eventually this navigation is going to get unprecise because any error you make will keep adding up. Uh, inertial navigation is prone to running away which is why it also has to be recalibrated be it from running away slowly or from running away suddenly. Any error your, accelerate, uh, your accelerometer makes is a little error in velocity that never really gets corrected. It just stays in and m maybe if it's a generally unprecise sensor then these little imprecisions even out a bit and you get what is called in mathematics a random walk and you only slowly diverge from your actual position. But in certain cases this can uh, get a lot more catastrophic, for example, on a sharp impact. If a, if a spacecraft or a navigation unit is suddenly jerked around, if it impacts somewhere and for a very short moment it is subjected to a very strong, very short-term acceleration and that amount of acceleration is higher than the accelerometers can measure. So the accelerometers or maybe even just the software freaks out, makes a large mistake. Maybe if the acceleration is larger than what the accelerometer can measure, the accelerometer just measures the most extreme acceleration it can measure, although it's actually more, and this is one big error that stays in your simulation for the entire flight path. So if your vehicle, for example, collides with something and is suddenly accelerated by, say, 10 meters per second of uh, overall velocity change over a very very short amount of time with a very strong short-term acceleration and the accelerometer fails to measure the whole amount of acceleration maybe it just measured 5 meters per second now you have a difference between reality and your navigation unit of 5 meters per second 
and that stays in there so your navigation position, the your assumed position based on your navigation relative to your actual position is going to keep drifting off at a rate of 5 meters per second now. That's referred to a an inertial navigation system running away at essentially runs away from the uh, real position. Another large factor is the uh, angular velocity which is hard to measure very precisely and this also adds up a lot. Uh, if you mismeasure your uh, orientation by say one degree and then you move on to uh, say 20 kilometers away and you mismeasured your uh, orientation in the beginning then now your position is mismeasured by the drift of that misorientation. Uh, so by 20 kilometers times the sinus function of one degree which is actually around 300 meters so quite a bit and if you make several such mistakes then uh, these can lead to some very weird navigation results like a small drone for example being uh, navigated successfully back to its starting point but since it mismeasured its orientation by one degree while it was 20 kilometers away, it now thinks it's 300 meters away from its starting point still. And other than that, there is of course just the limit of overall sense of precision and long time. Over long time, this random walk happens and you drift off. So it needs recalibrating once in a while. Also, it's of course notable that in space, this is only a limited navigation method because it's basically running a numerical simulation of a Kepler orbit. Which, of course, you can also piece together from parabola pieces or Kepler orbit pieces. Uh, because in space, when, y when you're free-falling, the accelerometer is just going to measure nothing and you're just gonna end up running a simulation of your free fall around Earth. Of course, any acceleration that isn't measured by an accelerometer, like gravity, free fall, has to be accounted for and therefore known when uh, doing this type of navigation. So, if, for example, you have a spacecraft and it's flying by an unknown object, then this object's gravity is going to cause an error in navigation because if you don't know about this object's gravity then it's going you're going to free fall around it it's going to slightly change your flight path and this is something you're not going to measure your accelerometers don't measure any acceleration due to gravity so it's while being usable in low earth orbit where we know the gravity for each position it's always pointing towards the center of the earth at 9.81 meters per second or if you go further away from Earth it gets weaker but if you're going to navigate around unknown objects you're going to uh, get such errors because you basically have to simulate your orbital mechanics around that object so you'll have to recalibrate this type of navigation system regularly using other types of navigation at least if your flight is taking so long that this drift is getting uh, notable if you're just going to have a very short flight or if you just calibrate it and you're going to uh, do a sharp maneuver then you don't have to recalibrate during that sharp maneuver but if you're going to navigate for a longer time you'll have to recalibrate regularly using some other navigation method orientation is, is fairly easy to calibrate you can use a compass and a sun tracker or a horizon tracker when you're in an aircraft in a spacecraft you can just use a star tracking camera and for the rest of your position and velocity you can use uh, any other means of navigation that I've uh, already discussed earlier. You can use GPS, which of course also has its limits, proposal navigation, you can, uh, if you're in deep space, you can uh, try to find certain planets with a telescope and find out which way they are from you. If you know which direction some planet is from you, then you know that you're in the opposite direction from this planet. If you do that for several planets, you can essentially have a virtual orbital map in your computer and just where the lines cross, you are. 
although these lines might not even cross at all if there is a slight imprecision in your measurements, which there will always be because uh, in practice no measurement will be perfectly mathematically precise. It's impossible, so where these lines get closest to crossing. So I hope you enjoyed this little introduction into how inertial navigation works. Uh, now you know why it is limited, but also why it is so widespread, because you just need a sensor that basically always works, and why navigation units that use inertial navigation always come with uh, additional sensors like additional GPS or a compass or an optical sensor. So if you have any questions about aerospace engineering or science in general, I'm always open for suggestions, and as always, thanks for watching.